Church family, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I want to invite you to find your place in 1 John. 1 John, and this morning we're going to look at verses 19 through 21. I'm concluding preaching verse by verse through this letter of the New Testament. Uh, Lord willing, we'll transition uh, into 2nd and 3rd John and have some different emphases. That's the correct word, Kyle. <laughs> emphases over the next couple months as well. Here, John gives Holy Spirit inspired instruction to his readers concerning how to live in a sin sick world. And these words have meaning and application for us living in the 21st century world. John's readers were experiencing the infiltration of a false teaching we now know as the Gnostic heresy. And many Christians had a form of Christianity that had been shaped by this false teaching known as the Gnostic heresy. You know, you could say a lot about this philosophy, but one thing that's really important to understand is this, it, it, it diminished the importance of Christ. It taught that he wasn't fully God and fully man. And then secondly, this false teaching gave license or gave permission for Christians to engage in all types of gross immorality. It taught what we call a, a dichotomy of the, the soul and the body. It taught a sacred spiritual split in one way. It taught that the soul is all that matters, the spiritual part of your constitution or your human makeup is all that matters. So you can do whatever you want with your body. And this gave way for gross sexual immorality. So can you imagine being a genuine convert, a genuine believer in a first century church, and there's people in your church teaching in such a way to diminish the importance of Christ, to say Christ wasn't 100% man, 100% God. What the apostle said isn't really true. And then can you imagine being in a church in which there are professing believers engaging and wicked types of immorality. Now, now, John knew all this was going on, and he writes 2 Timothy 3.16 by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to encourage believers living in such a confused, sin-sick world. And we have these words preserved for us. And they are without error, and they are authoritative for us, and they are sufficient for us. As we navigate life in a 21st century world in which there's so much confusion and so much corruption, thanks be to God, we have the word of God as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Isn't this book remarkable that it speaks right to our current situation? And so we have truth to help us live in a sin sick world. Now, we know, living in 21st century world, what it's like to deal with a sickness, right? Over the last 18 months or more, we've had to deal with this thing called COVID. And then on top of that, it seems like as society is getting back uh, more and more to normal, we've seen an increase in other types of sicknesses. My family's been hit over the last couple of weeks by some type of virus, not COVID, don't worry, but worry, it's something else. Uh, we don't know what, and Laura is still really struggling. We actually went away on vacation, tried to go on, away on vacation this past week. We're at the beach for about an hour and a half to two hours, went back to the hotel room, Laura couldn't sleep. She woke up in the middle of the night, woke me up, said, we're leaving tomorrow morning, we're going back home. I'm too sick to be in a hotel room. So that was the end of our vacation. But hey, when you, when you have sickness, you have to learn to cope with it, right? So one thing we've been doing is when we go to bed at night, we make sure on the nightstand there's cough drops, there's water, and there 
there are plenty of Kleenexes or something to blow your nose with. Y'all know what that's like, right? So when you're sick, you've got to You've got to be wise in how to cope with it. When it comes to living in a sin-sick world, you as a believer, if you want to be spiritually strong, if you want to have joy in Christ, if you want to have peace of mind, if you want to be a witness for him, if you want to one day have eternal reward for being faithful, you need right now in the here and now to have the word of God inform you how to live in a sin-sick world. How can you live in a sin-sick world? I believe John gives you three actions you can take. Number one, realize you are different. Uh, Just settle on this fact. Know it. Be aware of it. You are not of this world. Being in Christ gives you a new spiritual standing, a new spiritual citizenship. You are not like the rest of the world. One of the biggest problems in the church in America right now is that we are paying the cost for years and years of trying to be like the world. And now we're finding out that doesn't pan out, it doesn't pay off, it doesn't work. Scripture says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So to be spiritually strong and secure and steadfast, you have to have this settled conviction that you are different. Now look at how John speaks of this in verse 19. He says, we know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Notice that key word, no. This was one of the Gnostic, the false teacher in the first century. It was one of their cherished words. They liked to speak of how they had a special knowledge. And they liked to make everyone else feel bad. Can you imagine being in a Sunday school class and you try to give feedback to the teacher and the teacher is one of the Gnostics and he says, sorry, you don't have the special knowledge. You're not in the know like us. Your input doesn't matter. That, that's kind of the atmosphere of the first century church. And so John here, he's writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but we see the human element come out. He's kind of tongue in cheek. He uses the Gnostic's favorite word. And he said, we know. So it's almost like he's saying to the false teachers, you say you know some stuff. I want to remind you, we know some stuff as well. We know that we are of God. We are of God. Strong language here, it literally means out of God. We are out of God. He uses the Greek preposition ek that speaks of something coming out of something or a location. And it is a strong description of the Christian. You are not of this world. You are out of God. The language was used of a child being birthed out of a mother, and John uses this language to remind believers, you have been birthed out of God, John 3, 3. You must be born again, and you have been born again. Galatians 3, 2, when you placed your faith in Christ for salvation, you received the Spirit of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're not like the rest of the world. You're new. You are out of God. You are different. And then John said at the end of verse 19, the whole world is under sway of the evil one. So he reminds them of who they are. They've they've experienced the new birth. They are citizens of heaven. And they are different from the rest of the world. The rest of the world is under the sway of the evil one. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this age has blinded the eyes of lost people from seeing the truth of Christ. Do you ever watch the news or do you ever consider things that your neighbors do or lost family members do and think, what in the world are they thinking? How in the world do they see it that way? I'll, I'll tell you how they see it that way. They are under a spiritual spell. 
There is an invisible world war going on in the world, Ephesians 6.10. And Jesus referred to Satan as the God, with a lowercase g, the God of this age. And there has been a war since the Garden of Eden to deceive people, to keep them from the truth of Christ. And that war is still waging and recognize it, believer. This world's not your home. You're, not, you're just passing through. You are of God, out of God. You are different. And if you feel strange, and if you feel pressure, if you feel weird, and if you feel insecure sometimes living in this world, guess what? Those should be normal feelings for the child of God. Because you have the Spirit of God within you And all of the principalities of this world are under the spell and sway of the evil one. They're unredeemed. They're following Satan's value system that John talked about earlier in 1 John 2.16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So if you want to stay strong in a sin-sick world, you've got to come to grips with this according to the truth of God. You're of God, the world is not, and by faith you have to regularly remember that and preach that to yourself. You've gotta make sure you're regularly feeding your soul with the stuff of God's word, not the stuff of this world. You've gotta work hard to abide in Christ, live by faith, and walk in the Spirit. You need to make sure that your values and your identity are not wrapped up in what the world thinks. You got to make sure your values and identity are wrapped up in what the Lord thinks. This is key to being strong in a sin-sick world. I have uh, an issue in life with flat feet. And so um, that, that brings problems. I was never real fast in school. I was kind of slow. I was once called a clodhopper, whatever that is, by a coach. So it wasn't real fast. <clears throat> Will, my middle, has inherited my feet, and so I, I try to help him with running and things and show him some techniques. If I can remember when I, I got to kind of, I guess I still am middle age, but maybe in my early 30s, I got to where my feet were just hurting all the time. I've still had this problem even in the last year where every once in a while I'll get a stress fracture in my foot. And I remember on one occasion I'd gone to, actually went to a podiatrist, you know, limping, can hardly walk. And he said, well, the problem is those shoes right there. And I had on a new pair of Nikes. And he said, for a guy like you with your feet, you've just got to give up on wearing those shoes. Now, if, if I had my choice, and I have a, pictures of a couple pair of shoes here they're going to put on the screen. This first pair is a pair of Nikes. If I had my choice, I'd love to have a pair of those. Those are 1989 Air Jordans, all right? I'd love to have a pair of shoes like that. But if I wore those shoes, Houston, we'd have a problem, all right? So then on Sunday mornings, those might be my weekend shoes. I would love to have a pair of nice Johnston and Murphy dress shoes with the hard soles. I had a pair of those before. But if pastor had those on, my feet would really be in pain this morning. You can take those pictures down. I can remember going to see this podiatrist one time, and he said, hey, you're just going to have to come with, to grips with the fact that you can't do it. You can't wear those Nikes. You can't wear those hard-soled dress shoes. And then he told me the types of shoes I could wear, and I'm wearing a pair this morning. And he told me, you're going to need this type of insert in your shoes. You've just got to come to grips with it. You've got to realize this is who you are and what your feet are like. And can I tell you, believer, this morning from the Word of God, If you want to be strong in this sin-sick world, you've got to come to grips with who you are. You've got to know that you are a child of Christ. Scripture speaks of you as being a foreigner, an alien, a stranger in this world. Come to grips with it and develop this motto 
This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Realize you are different. Number two, this morning I'd say this. Realize you have a special source of insight. <coughs> Excuse me. Realize you have a special source of insight. Look at verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. It's like John's goal was to see how many times he could say the word true or truth in one verse or in one sentence. What's his point here? He wants to remind believers who are surrounded by error that they have truth. And get the point, believer, though the world is under the spell and sway of the wicked one, though you see truth and falsehood all around you, Though error seems to be increasing in our society, as God's children, you have truth. You have truth in the scriptures you hold in your hand, and you have truth in the spirit who lives in your heart. The entire Christian life is one of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus prayed for us and said, sanctify them, Father. By your word, your word is truth. When Jesus spoke of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives within our hearts, he called him the Spirit of truth. So remember this. As a believer, as you live in this world, you don't have to give your mind and your soul over to all of the error and deceit of fallen society. You have truth. Let the Word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Look how he says this in verse 20. Look in your Bible. He says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. The language here in the original language of the text is perfect tense. It speaks of a past action, but not just a past action. It speaks of a past action with abiding or continual or life changing result. John mean, meant to tell believers that the Lord had permanently given them a special source of understanding and that his gift of this special source of understanding had life-changing implications. And we know that through the Holy Scriptures and through the Holy Spirit, we have a source of of spiritual understanding. As we are inundated with the world's values, as we continually are confronted with Satan's value system through the world, we regularly have a source of insight where we can check what we're hearing to see whether or not it lines up with the truth of our Creator. Jesus spoke of himself as being a source of truth in John 8, 12. He said, I am the light of the world. So even though the world's in darkness, there is a light shining, and that light is Jesus, and he has truth, wisdom, insight for all who will turn to him and follow, me, follow him. He says, anyone who follows me, John 8, 12, will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. This past week, trying to have some semblance of a vacation, we went to the, a movie for the first time in years. And it was a Disney movie. And about halfway through, I couldn't believe what was happening. They were depicting one of the characters as being a homosexual man. I believe it went over my children's head. I don't believe, they were like focused on the gorillas and tigers and stuff. They weren't picking up on what the message that was being sent. But still I'm thankful as a father that even though the world will try to 
put messages in my children's minds, and though the, this world is trying to deceive my family, I'm able to sit down after supper each evening and open up the word of God and give them truth straight from heaven for their souls. I'm thankful as a man as I live in this world and just trying to watch a, a sports game or trying to read the news online, I'm continually inundated with the world's way of thinking. But I'm thankful as I got up this morning and I was in Proverbs chapter 8 and I was in Galatians chapter 4 and as I was reading in 2 Kings 11 and 12, the very God of heaven was giving me insight and information. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And as believers, we have truth. Remember, believer, you have a special source of insight. But look here at how strong John speaks of this. Look in verse 20, and then I'll move on. He says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. And then look at what he says next. We are in the true one. So not only do you as a believer hold truth in your hand, you have truth in your heart. You have truth in your hand through the scriptures. You have truth in your heart through the Holy Spirit. So this isn't just an abstract, external source of information like the Gnostics had. This is a real, living, abiding, in, internal truth. Through Jesus Christ, you as a believer have a personal relationship, John 17, 3, with the true God. And you, like the believers in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, you are one who has turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Know that you have eternal life. Know that you have truth. Though error may seem to be increasing all around you, you have the word of God as a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path, and you have the spirit of God within you, John 15, 16, to guide you into all truth. Be careful that your ears aren't overcome by all of the lies of this world. Abide in the truth of Christ. Regularly read God's word. Make Lord's Day worship a priority. Be a part of a discipleship and life group class. Make sure you are regularly consuming and understanding the word of God. We need scripture like never before. Lastly, I'll close with this. How can we live in a sin-sick world? I encourage you with the last verse of John's letter. Guard yourself from the tendency to idolatry. I love the words we sang earlier, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I often during my confession time and prayer each morning recite those words to the Heavenly Father. You may not believe that as your pastor. I hope that doesn't make you think, wow, I don't know if I can trust my pastor. Well, I, I can tell you I don't even trust myself half the time. And I have to pray, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Lord, by your grace, take my heart and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. I, I, I realize that I'm a fallen man, I'm an imperfect man. And like any fallen or an imperfect man, I am prone to self-love and idolatry. John understood the human constitution that although a believer is in Christ, a believer still has mere humanity. A believer still has that flesh that Paul spoke of at the end of Romans chapter 7. So a believer should always be on guard. And John said, look in verse 21, little children guard yourselves from idols. Why does he say little children? If I... If I preach to you and said now little children you might take that as a term of derision like who's a preacher think he is he's talking down to us well for John that was a term of affection it, it, it was intended to say hey I love you church I love you so hear what I'm about to say guard yourselves from idols but not only was it a term of affection it was a term used of believers 
John meant to be very clear. He wasn't talking to the Gnostics. He wasn't talking to the heretics. He wasn't talking to the sexually immoral. immoral. He wasn't talking to the false counterfeit believers. He meant to be real clear. I'm talking to you, church. I'm talking to you, believers. What's the takeaway for us? Even real believers can get off course. Even real believers can be distracted by the things of this world. Even a real believer can be turned away by idolatry. So he says, guard yourselves. It's a word used of a Roman soldier strategically guarding a location. The imagery here depicts effort, intentionality, hard work. Guard yourself. I can remember my brother speaking about his time in Afghanistan and how he would have to do duty guarding a location. And he said, man, it was hard to stay awake. I drank a lot of coffee. Usually I had my rifle in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. That helped me stay awake until there I came under fire one night. My first response was just to throw my coffee. Coffee spilled all over me. Soldier knows you gotta be, you gotta work hard to stay on guard. And the Bible here encourages believers of all generations, listen, this is your duty, this is your station in life. You've got to always be on guard. Until you die, you've got to be on guard against idolatry. Remember the nature of idolatry. Psalm 115, four, the psalmist spoke of this corrupt, debased thing called idolatry, and he reminded himself and he reminded his readers through his song that idolatry is useless, it is pointless, it does not help, it, often, it, it ultimately is of no benefit to the soul. He spoke of the idols of the nations by saying their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot see, mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throats. And we're reminded that idolatry is ultimately foolish because idolatry never benefits. Idolatry never adds anything to your life. Now the the big question is what is idolatry? The Lord said when he gave his moral law for all of creation, commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, do not make for yourself a graven image that is a statue or an idol to worship. So know this, this is a part of God's moral law for all of creation. Humankind needs to be on guard against worshiping false gods and about making, need to be on guard against making gods. Now, what is an idol? The word idol literally meant to see. It spoke of something one observed with their eyes. More specifically, it spoke of something one set his or her eyes upon. So the word idol, idol at its essence speaks of something that captures your attention captures your attention and takes your attention away from God and upon that thing so take note believer an idol isn't just a gold statue don't think of well I don't, I, I've seen those statues of Buddha I've never bowed down and burned incense or sacrificed a chicken I guess I'm I'm not guilty of idolatry realize this an idol is anything that captures your attention and takes your focus away from God and onto that thing it's anything that becomes first in your heart before the Lord So be on guard. An idol may not just be a graven image or a statue to Buddha or some other God. An idol can be your car. An idol can be your bank account. An idol can be your children or your grandchildren. 
An idol could be your health. An idol could be your reputation and what people think of you. An idol could be a cherished hobby. An an idol could be any possession. An idol could be relaxation and recreation. An idol is anything that becomes first in your heart and life above God. So if you want to stay strong in a sin-sick world, know you're different. Know that you have a special source of insight, but then stay on guard against idolatry. This world system is constantly pressing us to idolatry, to put our attention on things other than the Lord. So be on guard. This past week, again, we went to the beach, but we were there like an hour and a half to two hours. It was more, it was kind of in between, but when the kids said, we're leaving already? I said, hey, we had two hours at the beach. I was kind of rounding up to make it sound better. But I did something I'd never done at the beach before. I think I'm getting older because we went to the beach and when I packed, I packed a long sleeve shirt. It was like one of these wicking shirts, like the athletic material. But I packed a long sleeve shirt. I had bought some of those uh, gaiters. You know what those are? Like the things that you wear down here around your neck and that you you can pull up for a mask. Well, I'd bought some of those during the whole COVID thing to wear while I was, you know, out and about and in stores and such, but I actually took one and wore it to cover my neck. And then I had a, a, a hat on. I'm totally getting into old guy land here. All I was thinking about was, I don't want to get sunburned. So I got long sleeves on, sitting in my beach chair, a hat, a gator protecting my neck. And then I had the beach towel that I would normally, you know, put out in the sand and lay on it with my shirt off. Now I'm sitting in a chair and I've got it covering my knees and my legs. I don't want to get sunburned. You know, I'm starting to think about the possibility of skin cancers in the future. So some of you all who've had stuff removed have told me that the doctor told you that you get, didn't get it just recently. You got that skin cancer when you were about my age. So I'm being careful. Uh, I'm on guard. So if you see me at the beach and I've got an umbrella and every square inch of uh, skin covered, I'm guarding myself. And know that you've got to guard yourself. Some of you need to put boundaries in place. Some of you need to unsubscribe to uh, some streaming services. Some of you need to get software on your computer to, to block certain sites. Some of you perhaps need to do away with certain friendships that that hurt your soul. You've got to guard yourself from idolatry. Some of you need to sit down and make out a new budget because your budget reflects the fact that you value stuff of this world more than the stuff of the Lord. Some may need to rearrange your life priorities. I do this on a a regular basis. You need to sit down and write out what your life priorities are. Then you need to look at your schedule. You need to look at your weekend schedule. You need to look at how you're spending your evenings and your time. Because guess what? You may not be guarding yourself from idolatry through how you schedule and through your priorities. 